I get to make the official announcement today. You know, it's already in your bulletin, and I know that, you know, this has been no secret that anybody's even tried to keep. But next Sunday, of course, Jesse will be presented to you as the one to be voted on by the church body to be our next pastor. And so I was so delighted to be able to have a role in, in introducing him and then transferring to him my my role that I've gotten to play. It's been a privilege that I've had every single Sunday morning when I've walked up these steps. I've felt the great privilege that you have given to me. It's been a great gift to me, and I thank you so much. And each and every single morning, I've, I've felt like it was a sacred trust, trust of the Lord and a trust that you've given me as well. And uh, you know what? It's with the same enthusiasm that I get to introduce Jesse, who will be coming to preach in a few minutes, and you guys will be voting on next Sunday. But let me tell you how the story began, okay? It was actually in June, back in hot summertime June. My phone rang. I was somewhere wherever I was in Texas that day, and it was Jesse. He said, hello, I got your name and number off the website, the First Baptist Church website, and our family's been doing ministry, and he said, we really feel called to Del Rio. My family's there. I'm from there. Real important things in our lives have happened there. In fact, Bethany and Jesse met in Acuna, and it was in Acuna and doing mission work over there that God reeled back in a rebelling Jesse who was running from God. And that happened in Acuna for him one summer as he was here working with teams. And so, so many important things have happened in their lives in this place. They were just feeling convicted by the Lord to come back, come back to Acuna, to the place where he had blessed them so much. And this was his question. You know, uh, do you know of any Southern Baptist churches in the area of Del Rio who may have a position open that we would be real interested in pursuing that? And I said, well, I may. <laughs> and so isn't that in compliance with so many of us have talked about this for so many months? You know, it's not on us to go out and mount a search and to find the next pastor for First Baptist Church. Who's, who's the boss of this church? The Lord himself. And doesn't it make sense, just doesn't it make sense that he wouldn't hide the next pastor, but that he would be preparing him and, and his family, and then, then that we would just recognize this preparation that he was, instead of us having to mount some search that we would just be discerning. Doesn't that just make sense, all the sense in the world? And your committee has done that so well. And, uh, you know, that's a little different way than most churches go about this transition process. And I just really felt impressed on by the Lord to ask them, let's go in discerning mode. Let's don't go into search mode. And then simultaneous with that, Jesse made that call. Now, we did all due diligence. We didn't say, oh, okay, we got a call, done deal. You know, they did. You, we, there were other resumes and some other suggestions that were made, and they were diligent to follow those up, and they were prayerful to follow those up, but they stayed in discerning mode. And I'm just so proud of you guys for doing that and thankful for you. And so uh, this is where we are today. And just to let you know my, my place, you have blessed me big time. All of these Sundays, you know, it's been about 52 of them that I've been here with you now. You have been a constant source of encouragement to me. Your reception of me and your blessing me week in and week out. See, that's why I know that Jesse and his family are in for a real treat because of the way you've treated me. And so I want to be real clear, and all of that care and love and encouragement and appreciation, confidence, support that you've given me over these months, let's transition it, okay? Transfer all of that with me to Jesse. I know, we're speaking presumptuously, you know, the... He has to meet with this mean group of guys called the deacons tonight. 
And so we'll see how you come out of that deal. You know, Jesse, we'll see how it works out for you. Uh, you have my number if you need rescue. And, uh, and, and then, you know, he's been here with us so much. You know, we're not really having one of these formal grill the candidate meetings because so many of you have gotten to know him and Bethany and the kids already and and uh, you'll still have a chance to here on Wednesday nights as well and so you can do that informally too this week but next Sunday uh, as, as you you know do what God impresses on you to do stay in discerning mode and cast your vote that's an exercise of the priesthood of the believer as you do that here's my request of you okay and I'm kind of running a risk. John chapter 3, John the Baptist was there with his disciples. And he saw Jesus coming down the road. And he, he called him out. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And as Jesus got closer, he said this, Guys, here's what we all need to do. He needs to become more important. And I need to become less important. Now, I'm not confused. I know that I'm not John the Baptist. And Jesse may be named Jesus, but we know that he's not Jesus. <laughs> and so that's where the comparison starts. But the sentiment is exactly the same. And you know what John's Bab John the Baptist's disciples did? They went to Jesus. And they became his disciples. And so this is my invitation to join me in transitioning to Jesse. The role and the confidence that you've given me, this great privilege, let's transfer it well, okay? Good. Jesse, come, share the word of the Lord with us, and we're so thankful for you guys. Bethany, we're so thankful for you and these sweet little children that you guys are, are leading so well. We're just really thankful for you. Come, come and lead. Where do we go from there? <laughs> Woo. I, I'm already tearing up. Um, Pastor Hooker, it's been an honor. And um, I've, I'm so grateful for your counsel, your encouragement. Um, Jimmy was talking about a family, right? Brothers and sisters in Christ and being there for each other. And you've, you've done that. For me and my family. And, um, <clears throat> All right. um, and for those of you that were here last week, wasn't it awesome the way that we coordinated it as well? Right? This week, again, not our genius, but God's hand. If we go um, to 1 Peter, we're still in 1 Peter, chapter 1. Um, and we're going to be reading verses, let's see, where am I? Verses 10 through 16. And, it, and it's a bit of a, a, a shout out to those that have come before us. Uh, it's giving recognition um, to the work that's been done. And, uh, and I'm just amazed by God's hand and, and how he... Um, he is sovereign and he has it all in his hands and he is in control and I'm just blown away by um, his hand in my life and it brings great comfort and peace knowing and a bunch of emotion too um, that he has got it all he has got it all under control um, can we pray before we get going will you pray with me Lord we thank you this morning. It's such a, a, a special morning. Um, we are blessed to be here today to listen to your word, God, and, and for you to speak to us through your word. I ask that your Holy Spirit, God, would guide us and give us discernment and understanding. And then, um, as the call to action comes, Lord, that we may be able to surrender to you and that you would lead us in our actions. We love you, Lord, and we worship you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll start um, on verse 10. 
And, and some people might look at verses 10 through 12 and just kind of go past it. I'm going to slow it down just a little bit because I know I'm limited in time. Um, but this is very important to recognize those people that have come before us and that have done the work, God's work. Verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophet, what salvation are we talking about? We, last week, just a point of review, we are talking about this, this hope, this hope for the exile. Um, Peter's talking to those churches that have been dispersed, that are still gathering, still meeting, still serving the Lord in all of these different areas. And, and it's, the churches are in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. We can throw in there Del Rio. You guys in Del Rio. And he's saying, and as he's recognizing and communicating how important this great hope is, he just bursts out into blessing the Lord. Just into almost him. Just, he, he is recognizing what God has done, his greatness, his steadfast love for us, his mercy for us. And he's just like, bless, bless be the God and Father of Jesus Christ. And he's telling us, this hope, this hope for the exile, this hope for the Del Rio exile, it's not going to fade. It's not going anywhere. It's kept. And those that are with me, I will keep also. So this is what... Verse 10 is talking about concerning this salvation, this great hope, the salvation of our souls, like uh, verse 9 says, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. They did the hard work. They studied and they listened to the Holy Spirit and they were guided by the Holy Spirit and they longed to see what you are seeing. Verse 11, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. They studied carefully. They knew that the Messiah would come. They knew that the Christ would come and that he would suffer and take the penalty of our sin, but also him being glorified. They foresaw that and they longed to see it. Verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. The work that they were doing was for us. As we consider what's been going on this morning, the the work that has been done, Gratefulness arises for for the workers and for God and his great mercy toward us. Great is thy faithfulness, right? That he knows every detail of our life, our mess-ups, but also how he will use us to bring glory to his name. For his fame and for his glory, he will use every situation, everything in our lives, for those that love him, he can use every situation for our good and for his glory. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. And the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit send from heaven things into which angels long to look. The prophets and the angels have an idea of what is to come. But they haven't seen the details of all that will come. And they want to see it. They long to see it. They long to see what we will see. What we will be first-hand witnesses of. Therefore, 
So having talked about all of this, this salvation, the work that's been done, God's mercy and, and, and his grace toward us, having talked about this, having seen it, have, having it been an, announced to us, therefore, what? Preparing your heart, your minds for action. Roll up your sleeves. I don't have any today. Get ready to work. What are we working on? Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We go back to that great hope. Therefore, being sober-minded, prepare for action. It takes work. It takes work individually. There is some intentionality in my life that needs to happen. Constant communication with the Lord Prayer is huge. His word. So that we don't leave it, right, to subjective ideas of what, what kind of God God is or who God is. My God is this, my God is that. He wouldn't say that, he wouldn't do that. His word. We need to be in here to get to know him and for him to transform us. Because we come in, yeah, and we may come up to the altar, and, but there is a change that needs to happen from that point forward. And it takes work. So Peter is saying, prepare your minds. Be sober-minded. Think rightly. It's like, I like to use this illustration um, because it just, it, to me, is very clear. We know what gravity is, and, and we act in a way that we recognize that gravity is real. And if I get any closer to the edge of this step, gravity is going to take over, right? So I, I'm not going to do it. So I live my life in such a way that I recognize that gravity is a real thing. Being sober-minded is exactly that. Is being convinced that eternity with him and eternity away from him is a real thing. And so we live our life here as his ambassadors Knowing that that is for real. Being convinced that that is for real. Not a possibility. Not a maybe. We are convinced that eternity is for real. And that there's only two places that we can go. And so, how we live our life here dictates where we will end up. So Jesus is saying, be sober-minded. Think rightly. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Just think on that. Peter is saying, think about that. When you finally are in front of him and his glory is revealed. In the Old Testament, um, in Isaiah, in, in, through a vision, he gets to see that glory. And he says, man, I am, I am so messed up. Just being in front of God, being there, he recognizes just how short he falls. I'm a sinner. I can't even speak. I can't say anything. Because... Imagine being there. When we're finally in his presence. Set 
set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. The instructions in the Bible are not against us. It's not. cramping my style. It's not, you know, messing up my life and my freedom. They are for us. God is taking care of us. Don't touch that stove. It is hot. Do take a shower because you stink. You know, it's... <laughs> yes and no's. Do's and don'ts. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Don't go back to doing the same things that you did. Dealing with the same situations the way that you've always dealt with them. Because that way of thinking is corrupt. It's been influenced by the world around us. And what used to seem like wisdom for us when we were still a part of that picture, still part of that lost world, doesn't make sense under the focus of his word. Don't go back there. Don't go back to that same way of thinking. Keep moving forward. Set your hope fully on that, that moment when you see his glory. Don't go back to your former ignorance. I think Peter just called us dumb. Don't go back to that. Be wise. Be sober-minded. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. So, I think what he's saying is when we come in here in the building on Sundays, we should have the right conduct. No, he's saying in here and out there in every moment of your life. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. So, tomorrow is Monday. You know, we got a fresh week, so we're going to psych ourselves up. This week, I'm going to be holy, and, and, and we're good to go. Is that, is that the way we do it? Right. And Monday comes around, and I'm like, I need like 10 cups of coffee. Now, this is not something that can be forced. It's not something that we just decide to do. I'm going to be holy today. I don't know about you, but talk to the hand. I know. This is not something that is forced. We have to allow. There, if we pay attention, there is prompting from the Lord. Right? There's this conviction. For those that call him Lord, there's this conviction that, that this voice, right? Man, I, I should be praying, or I should be reading. Ah, let's see what's on ESPN first. Whatever is good, whatever is pure, whatever of, is of good report. Focus, think on these things. So we know that we can't force this. We can't make it happen. So how do we go about doing this? Because Peter is just laying it out there, like the one that called you is holy, you also be holy. The more that we recognize how great God is, the more that we get to know who God is and his splendor and his greatness, the more we get to the point where we 
hate sin. And we need to get to the point where we hate sin. When we understand the consequences of sin, when we understand what could happen, not just to us, but to the people around us because of our sin, because of our old, ignorant ways. When we recognize that sin separates us from God, and it enslaves us, the more that we get to love God, not for what I get out of it, Yes, he can give me health. And yes, he provides for me. But it, the more that we love God for who he is, the more that we get to know God, the more this call to holiness happens in our life. The better that we understand Jesus' sacrifice. And the weight, we talked about a few weeks ago about the physical that, um, punishment that he went through on the cross is one thing, but to have felt the weight of all of our sin. That's a different kind of torture altogether. And so when we recognize and understand what he went through for us, the more this call to holiness begins to happen in our life. And then, the more that we recognize our position here as exiles, we are sojourners. the more compassion, the more love and mercy and grace flows through him, through us, to us, to others. And we're able to impact those around us because of his love flowing through us. Verse 16. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. It's a command, but it's also saying the end product. You shall be holy. Because anybody that's following me will be like me. In Romans 12, 9, marks of the true Christian, let love be genuine Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Ephesians 4, 22, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. That's how we can be obedient to this call. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. You shall be holy. You can't do it on your own. We can't do it on our own. We have to recognize where that source, that power comes from. And it's only through him. And it's a daily a daily thing that we go before him and we just surrender. Not something that we force, not something, well, you can do anything that you put your mind to. No, not here, not this. We have to completely surrender without any reservations, but not this part of my life. God, I don't know that I need to share this with anybody. No, everything, surrender everything 
all of me. There's a song that says that, right? All of me. I'm not good with lyrics, I'm sorry. My wife knows that I, I am poor. I, I recognize two or three words and then... But yeah, it's all of me. I surrender all of me to you. We have to think soberly and recognize our place. We are his servants, and he is glorious and magnificent and gracious. And his love doesn't end. And so when we get a good look at who he is and recognize him for who he is and how great he is, it should wake something. We talked about it last week. It should impact us. And that's how it happens. Be holy in all your conduct. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, God, for being able today to take some time um, to recognize those that have come before us that have laid a foundation, that have laid out a work, that have done the hard work, God. And then your call to us, your challenge to us, but also your reminder to us to, that we need to depend on you. We heavily depend on you to do the work in us so that we may be obedient Yes, we may fail in our walk, but Lord, you are gracious and merciful and the work continues in our life. You move us in sanctification to that holiness that Peter is talking about. And this is our great hope. This is the, the hope for the exile that Peter talks about. Thank you, Lord, for the work that you do in our life. We love and we worship you. We praise you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.